Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. We have joined together online for the webinar on COVID-19 vaccines and growing threat of variants of concern organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Let me warmly welcome all of you for this webinar on this timely topic, when as citizens of this country, we all try to fulfill our little bit of responsibilities by contributing whatever the way that we can to overcome the potential risk of the next surge of COVID-19 infection. It's with that objective that they say they may organize this webinar. At the outset, let me show my appreciation to the country office of the WHO for agreeing to co-host this webinar. Uh, now, if I could introduce you the moderator, the moderator for the evening would be Dr. Palita Bekun, past president, SLMA, and the WHO special envoy on COVID-19 for Southeast Asia, appointed by Director General, World Health Organization. At this stage, let me welcome Dr. Alaka Singh, the recently appointed WHO representative in Sri Lanka. Dr. Alaka Singh has technical experience focused on health systems, primary health care, and universal health coverage. She has an educational background on economics and development with first degree from the Delhi University and advanced degrees from the College of William and Mary Virginia, USA, and Cambridge University, UK. Let me invite Dr. Alaka Singh to speak a few words uh, before we commence the presentation. Dr. Alaka Singh, over to you. Good evening. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, this is, in fact, my first meeting in Sri Lanka and what a better platform than this one and to talk about the great challenge that has been fit that we are facing today in Sri Lanka and indeed globally. Um, I was asked to very quickly highlight some of the key issues in vaccination inequity regarding supply and distribution and the commitment of WHO towards developing countries. Um, I'm sure none of these issues are new to this very um, knowledgeable uh, audience, but I would like to highlight some key issues going forward in terms of what WHO is doing to meet the challenge, particularly in terms of access to vaccines and to make sure that the developing countries, including Sri Lanka, have the access that's required to meet this very daunting challenge of COVID-19. WHO's commitment to equitable access to vaccines is encapsulated in the Access to COVID-19 tool accelerator, the ACT accelerator. WHO helped establish this as a platform for global collaboration on development, production, and equitable access to not just vaccines, but also to COVID-19 test treatments. In fact, this has brought together an alliance across governments, scientists, businesses, civil societies, and global health organizations as never before. COVAX, as we know it, is the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator and focuses specifically on equitable access through main, two main mechanisms. One is the Advanced Market Commitment, the AMC, that's really an innovative financing instrument that focuses on 92 middle and low income countries, including Sri Lanka, to ensure equitable access to vaccines regardless of countries' ability to pay. And for in-country rollout, WHO has developed a fair allocation framework that identifies highest risk groups who should get priority access to vaccines, as in Sri Lanka, frontline health workers, people over the age of 65, and those under 65 with underlying health conditions. So what has actually happened in terms of equitable access to vaccines? Unfortunately, of the more than 700 million doses that have been administered so far, 
97% have gone to high or upper middle income countries. Um, so far as COVAX is concerned, while it has more or less met its target for the original year end goal for 2021 to make 2 billion doses available to participants, as Sri Lanka has suffered, supplies have been critically disrupted and delayed. In the case of Sri Lanka, this has been particularly acute in the case of AstraZeneca. Um, and of course, this has been the result of a number of well-documented factors, including bilateral agreements between manufacturers and countries, the diversion of production at the Serum Institute of India, an important early supplier to meet acute unforeseen domestic needs, as well as the challenges to scaling up deliveries across AstraZeneca's global manufacturing network. WHO, as an immediate key um, short-term solution, is an active dialogue with countries with, with excess supply to help alleviate shortages in other countries by sharing doses. We're seeing the impact of this already. For example, the US has made Moderna available both through bilateral agreements as well as via COVAX, and Sri Lanka has received a million doses this month. WHO is also working at a technical level to build a longer term portfolio, broadening the number of vaccines available to 10 to 12 vaccines to ensure suitability to all contexts and to mitigate risks around over-reliance on specific sources in case there are issues to related to failure at the R&D stage, regulatory hurdles or supply challenges. Um, speaking about developing countries more broadly, um, the first absorptive capacity, um, the first hurdle in some developing countries, of course, not in Sri Lanka, is absorptive capacity at the health systems level. Uh, in Sri Lanka, the country has demonstrated adequate capacity for vaccine rollout. However, there is a second challenge that also applies to Sri Lanka, and that really is the gap between availability and actual deliveries. There are a number of technical, regulatory, and legal tasks to be completed before doses can actually be released. Again, WHO is working closely with countries, manufacturers, and other stakeholders to minimize this gap. Um, none of them is, is, um, is really, uh, none of this is new to you. None of this is new to Sri Lanka. We're, then this, there, remain, there remain some serious challenges ahead. So much is unknown about this virus, and really the way forward is a collaborative effort. WHO in Sri Lanka is available to join forces with the Ministry of Health and other experts in Sri Lanka to make sure that we are able to overcome this challenge successfully. Thank you very much again for inviting WHO to this very important meeting. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Dr. Alaka Singh, for highlighting the situation with regard to uh, the challenges of distributing the COVID vac uh, uh, the vaccines for COVID-19 infection, as well as for being a strength for Sri Lanka for making the vaccines available for our people. Uh, let me now invite Dr. Palita Bekun to introduce speakers and to commence the presentation. Dr. Bikun, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Padma. Thank you to Dr. Padma Gunaratna and also to the me for organizing this. And I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Alaka Singh, as she said, uh, the significant, significant event for her because first time she's going live public in Sri Lanka to such a large audience. Thank you very much, Alaka, for your very, very informative uh, uh, comments. Since uh, Dr. Gunaratna and uh, and Dr. Alaka Singh have uh, laid out the context in which we are discussing this, uh, let me first of all mention one or two housekeeping things. Uh, I think most of you now are very familiar with how webinars are run. So uh, simply, if you have any questions or any comments, please uh, use, the, use the chat box. And uh, later, if we have time, we will probably be able to also take some questions uh, live from you if we have time. And for that, we'll have to use the raise your hand function. Those two things I also know. So please, please uh, uh, remember that to send any, any comments or questions on the chat. And we have somebody who's 
following it and we can pick up a few questions. I don't guarantee that we will answer everything, but we'll try to answer as much as possible. Now, having said that, without taking any more time, since we need to listen to the speakers and have a discussion afterwards, let me first of all invite Professor Annalise Wilder Smith who is a consultant to the Initiative of Vaccine Research in the WHO in Geneva, who has a lot of experience in all aspects of this subject. Can I invite Annalise, please, to make your presentation now? Thank you very much. Yes. Can you hear? And you will be, uh, I believe you will be talking on uh, the theme topic, COVID vaccines and variants of concern. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your invitation. Can you confirm that you hear me and see my slides? Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I really hold Sri Lanka very dear in my heart, given that I visited frequently and I work closely with Dr. Sita Tisera uh, with regards to dengue research. So now COVID. Um, so this, just to remind you, this is the global situation as of 1st of July. In those 24 hours prior, almost 400,000 new confirmed cases, 8,000 deaths. Cumulatively, it's now 181 million confirmed cases, and we all know this is an underestimate. And sadly, we are approaching the 4 million deaths um, milestone. The global situation is unevenly distributed with currently Brazil, Indonesia, Bangladesh, South Africa seeing a distinct rise in cases, whilst the US, Europe uh, cases are now stabilizing. There is also a wide variation in the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines with countries such, such as Israel, Chile, Mongolia, Qatar, United Emirates, and the US and the UK having achieved high coverage rates. Now, the unequal distribution and unequal dynamics of this tragic pandemic will also have an unknown impact on the ecology of variants of concerns, in short, VOC, locally, regionally, and globally. So how can variants affect global health goals? The characteristics of VOCs include reduced immune protection, increased disease severity, and higher transmissibility. Reduced immune protection with higher risk of natural reinfection or vaccine breakthrough, uh, this will impact our primary goal to reduce severe disease and deaths and protect our healthcare systems. The jury is still out whether these variants result in more severe disease. What we do know is if there is higher transmissibility and all of these variants have higher transmissibility, you will also see more severe cases. The ability to result in higher attack rates due to higher transmissibility also leads to the requirement for more stringent uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdowns, etc., but also requires higher vaccine coverage rates. Currently, there are four variants of concerns, and given the recent change in nomenclature, uh, you, you will see both terms now being used in my slides. A quick recapitulation. B117 is the variant first reported in the UK in December 2020, now renamed Alpha. B1351 is the variant first reported in South Africa, also in December 2020, now renamed Beta. P1 was first reported in Brazil in January and was renamed Gamma. And the newest kit on the block is the B16172, renamed Delta first reported in India, and please note, and that's important, all these variants were first observed in times of high transmission intensity and at times of national outbreaks. 
And these maps illustrate the current global distribution of these variants, despite travel restrictions, all variants basically have been reported now in most countries. Of note, Delta, the most recent kid on the block, has now spread to more than 90 countries. And the Delta variant is now taking over most of the, of the as, and that's replacing all the other variants in many of these 90 countries and is bound to increase further. So selective pressures on SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Evolution will select mutations, insertions, deletions, and recombinations. And we result in general adaptations in, in terms of uh, improved replication in human cells, thereby escaping from the um, innate immune system or escaping from the adaptive immune response by reducing reductions in utilizing antibodies and also an escape at the T cell level. So what drives variants? A uh, lot of people you know, say it's a high transmission or blame uh, imperfect vaccines. So most transmission of SARS-CoV-2 also like for influenza actually occurs a few days at, at really at the peak viremia, just before a strong adaptive response develops. In flu, no evidence of selection in vaccinated individuals has been reported. Um, what we do know is that there is an appreciable diversity that is only found in immune compromised patients. In fact, the South African beta variant B1351 was is thought to have evolved in, a, in an immune compromised patient who was not able to clear the virus. But there's so far no, no evidence for evolution in vaccinated individuals. In very small populations, selection is actually inefficient due to genetic drift. So in other words, a lower prevalence, which equals a lower transmission intensity, which equals fewer opportunities for beneficial mutation, mutation even if they are beneficial, than to also um, um, be selected out and replicate. So basically in small is if it's only a, a little um, circulation, you will hardly have any beneficial mutations. If they are beneficial and there's a low prevalence, there's a lower risk uh, to develop. And with, if you have a low uh, reproductive number, even beneficial mutations are less likely to spread. In other words, it's really in high transmission settings where you see these, this, uh, the variants of concerns occurring. In conclusion, imperfect vaccination will probably not accelerate uh, escape mechanisms. And the real, the, the message is we have to vaccinate as much as possible to minimize global viral prevalence or minimize global transmission intensity because that will slow down evolution. So the answer to the variants is vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Um, so there is a body of uh, evidence needed to document whether such variants of concerns have indeed have an impact on reduced uh, vaccine eff effectiveness. And this evidence range, ranges from, from basic science, animal models, infection, natural infection, evidence immunogenicity, and obviously clinical outcomes following vaccination. And there's now a growing body of evidence, although we still lack um, data for many of the vaccines. Uh, but there's also a hierarchy of evidence strengths with obviously randomized controlled trials, RCTs, being the most critical and informative for policy decisions. However, many of the RCTs were conducted before variants of concerns emerged. Therefore, supportive evidence can now only be obtained or gathered from post-introduction vaccine effectiveness studies, or in other words, observational studies conducted once the vaccine has been rolled out. Basic science, animal models, immunogenicity results are important, but they are not 
um, um, uh, they do not provide definitive answers for policy guidance and are just meant for hypothesis generation. Unfortunately, under pandemic pressure, policy decisions may need to be made in the face of imperfect or incomplete data. And that's a re in reality of all of us policymakers in this pandemic. So now let's go uh, uh, through several, through all the four variants um, and, and just go through the data. So here is the first slide on the B117, now the called alpha variant from the UK. On the very left column, you see the vaccines. And then the next column show the reduction of neutralizing and activity in laboratory assays. And remember that we actually do not really know what level of reduction you need to have to, to, to translate into reduct a reduced uh, vaccine efficacy. Then you have the column of, of, of clin clinical efficacy against the variants, then the non variants, and the overall effectiveness. And you see, reassuringly, reassuringly, for the B117 alpha variant, despite some reduction in utilizing activity, the clinical efficacy is basically maintained for the variants compared. To, for the B117 compared to, to the, to the, non, to the non-variants for, for most of the vaccine study. There may be a slight reduction, but overall for BB1, B117, this is very reassuring. The performance against the beta South African B1351 variant um, shows a more marked reduction of neutralizing activity, and that also translates in, an, in, a, more, in, a, in a reduction in, in vaccine effectiveness. But of note, in contrast to influenza vaccines, where if you do have a major endogenic drift or shift, you see a significant drop, if, if not you know, an on-off almost phenomenon for, for vaccine effectiveness, for all the variants, reassuringly, again, we only see a reduction, not just on and off. And also reassuringly, this reduction in vaccine effectiveness is less for severe disease. That means there's a preserved or maintained um, um, uh, protection against severe disease, whilst breakthrough disease is higher in just milder symptomatic illness. The performance against P1, we have fewer data for fewer of those vaccines because most of the vaccines were actually not, um, uh, the trials were not conducted in, 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 in Latin America. But you also see for the P1, reassuringly, overall VE is relatively maintained. Delta variant. Now, Delta variant is has now, according to Dr. Tedros's um, an announcement a few days ago is the fastest and fittest variant of all variants of concerns. It has a transmissibility that's 40 to 60% higher compared to the already high transmissibility of the alpha variant B117. It is originally from India, now in more than 90 countries, and is, inc is now increasingly the dominating variant in many of these countries. The Delta variant is a major setback to the pandemic. The reproductive number is thought to be, but not yet confirmed, but it's thought to be five to seven, which is higher than the original ancestral strain, which was thought to be two between 2.5 and 3.4 or whatever. Which means if you have a higher reproductive number, you will need a higher vaccine coverage to ensure herd immunity. So it is, it is a new challenge to us. So I'll show you some, some data that have now emerged for various of these vaccines. Um, so for the Pfizer vaccine, and for Pfizer, we usually have most of the data. You see here a comparison for two versus one doses. And you also see a comparison between the Delta and the Alpha variant to, to see what effect it is. And indeed, the Delta variant is associated with a more reduced a vaccine effectiveness compared to the alpha. After one dose, it's only 33%. But fortunately, again, a, a key message, with the second dose, it increases to substantial levels of 88%. So slightly lower than against B117, whereas than 93%. 
Um, so, and here are some results from, uh, from other vaccine effectiveness studies against the Delta variant. Um, the upper one is uh, from a study in Qatar, which confirms the UK data for Pfizer, that indeed after the first dose, you have relatively low effectiveness and you do need your second dose. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, the UK is now uh, reducing again the, they, they had an extended uh, interdose interval and they're now trying to, to bring it down uh, to a closer interval to ensure that the high proportion in the UK now has the second dose as the UK is facing a major Delta resurgent. The next one is, uh, let's, let's look, it's a small table uh, and that's now focused more on the AstraZeneca data uh, that came also, that came from the UK. And here, these are data against hospitalizations. That means against more severe disease. And against more severe disease, we all know that vaccine effectiveness is always higher than against symptomatic or mild uh, illness of any severity. For the AstraZeneca, um, you also see a reduction. Um, and I have to take away this. You see a reduction uh, uh, for both the Delta and the Alpha variant, but you also reassuringly, and it's important that you remember this, when you then look at the two doses for the AstraZeneca against Delta, it, against hospitalizations, it is 92% for Delta and also, and it's 86% for Alpha. So very reassuring. These are data against hospitalizations. The reduction of vaccine effectiveness is actually higher in, in, uh, for symptomatic disease. For co-vaccine, just, um, just now, I think it's only preprint, um, that's the inactivated vaccine developed by, by India. The efficacy data show uh, from clinical phase three trial results show a 65% protection against Delta uh, versus 79% against all of the variants in total um, and, and, uh, and remains has a very high protection against severe disease. Johnson Johnson, which is a single shot, shot COVID-19 vaccine, just came out with a preprint, I think, three days ago. Uh, first of all, showing that with a single dose, they still have good immune uh, persistence for up to six, eight months. This is the latest uh, time point. Um, but it also showed that the neutralizing activity against the Delta variant is higher or similar to, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the beta variant. And we know that the beta variant had a very high immune escape. So also reassuring data from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This table just summarizes and brings it all together. Don't want to go in too much detail, but just the big picture is transmissibility is documented to be higher for all variants of concerns. There's less um, definitive um, evidence where these are also associated with higher disease severity. The risk of natural reinfection so is, is also uh, um, higher for these variants, but less so for the alpha, higher for the beta variant, and probably we now also see it for the delta variant. Uh, we have now increasing robust evidence from various vaccine products that the effect uh, of the vaccine effectiveness against alpha is relatively maintained, is reduced, but not really markedly reduced for beta, gamma, and delta. Key messages to take home is high virus circulation drives variants of concern. That means, the emphasis means we need to roll out vaccines as fast as we can, even if that means that we have to use vaccines with a lower vaccine efficacy. We still have a public health impact, even if vaccines have a lower vaccine efficacy against symptomatic illness, as we know that all vaccines, all COVID-19 vaccines, do protect better against more severe disease and deaths. And after all, this is what we want. We want to prevent deaths, hospitalizations, and we want to protect our healthcare systems. And lastly, the vaccine coverage that we need uh, to achieve will vary on the vaccine characteristics. So if you have a lower vaccine efficacy, you will have need a higher vaccine coverage rate. And it also now depends on the variance of concerns 
because we know that they will reduce vaccine effectiveness, which means we also have to achieve higher vaccine coverage rates. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Annalise, for that very interesting and informative presentation. I'm sure there will be a few questions. I can see a few questions on the chat box already. The other question I wanted to ask you was, would you be willing to share these slides uh, if necessary? Sure. Okay? Yeah, after the, afterwards, we can share it to whoever might like to have it. Thank you very much once again. Uh, let me now move on to our second speaker, who is Professor Ben Cowling, who is a professor of infectious disease epidemiology in the School of Public Health in the University of Hong Kong. And uh, Professor Cowling will be speaking on antibody response to COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Cowling, the audience is uh, yours, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, good uh, evening, yeah. everybody. Thank from, you. Thank uh, you very much. From Hong Kong. Please so carry I, on. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So I will start by, by uh, focusing on the severity of COVID by age. And the plot on this slide shows estimates of the infection fatality risk in different age groups. So you can see that, for example, on the right hand side, for people age 80 to 90 years old, then for every 100 infections, there will be 10 deaths, perhaps. The percentage, the infection fatality risk is, is as high as 10%. This is really very substantial. As age comes down to younger age groups, the severity is, is much reduced. And by the time uh, reaching children aged between 10 and 20, actually, uh, there's very, very few deaths, even for a large number of infections. So when we think about vaccination strategies immediately, we think about protecting the most vulnerable groups, which are those on the right hand side, the oldest people in our community, and then also people who have a special uh, higher elevated risk of COVID-19, such as healthcare workers. And I think in most parts of the world, uh, the strategy has been to vaccinate, to prioritize vaccination in the elderly, and then also high uh, healthcare workers and high risk groups, and then progressively in younger and younger groups in the population as a whole. In general, I, I've been thinking about uh, what are the possible strategies for vaccination for COVID-19. And I think that the strategies boil down to two choices. And I put them on this slide. The first choice is saying that everybody needs to get vaccination to protect themselves against COVID. And when we follow that strategy, we really want to prioritize vaccination in the highest risk people and gradually expanding to everybody, ultimately offering everybody the chance to be vaccinated because without vaccination, uh, if you get infected, you may have a, uh, some risk of, of serious disease. The second strategy is called the herd immunity strategy, where we aim to get vaccine coverage up to a certain level, but not necessarily everybody, because we'd like to provide indirect protection to the most vulnerable groups by vaccinating perhaps people who are responsible more for transmission. And for COVID-19, that would be perhaps younger adults rather than older adults, but ultimately still aiming for very high vaccine coverage. And you may have heard in the media people talking about a target of 70% vaccine coverage. That may be with the second strategy in mind, with the herd immunity strategy in mind. However, with the Delta variant particularly, it seems to me that probably strategy one in the long term is going to be what most parts of the world end up with. And I wrote at the bottom here my own opinion, my own prediction, which is that within one to two years from now, almost everybody in the world will have an exposure to the virus. Now, some places like maybe Singapore, where, where uh, Professor Wilder Smith is based and, and Hong Kong, where I am, maybe we'll be able to keep the virus out for longer. But I think in most parts of the world, almost everybody is going to be exposed to COVID, have a potential to get infected within one to two years. And that means we have a race between vaccines and the virus on how each individual person is going to get their immunity because you can either get immunity from an infection or you can get immunity from vaccination. And for almost every age group, getting immunity through vaccination is lower risk than getting immunity through infection. We know there are risks of vaccines. 
for the AstraZeneca vaccine, there were the reports of the very rare blood clots for other vaccines may also be some very low level of risk. But certainly we know that COVID infection, COVID disease can be severe. And I showed on the previous slide the infection fatality risks. The exception, and I think the, the group that's going to be controversial is children, because in, in children, uh, the risks of COVID are, are so much lower uh, to start with. But that may be a, a separate issue. Now, when we, we come to vaccines, as, as Professor Wilder Smith described, uh, there's, there's different kinds of vaccines. And I want to talk here about the disease process on the left, a healthy person in the middle, someone who's sick, but still standing. And on the right, someone who's really very sick in a hospital needing oxygen. And so we can have some vaccines, which are really very good at stopping infection from occurring. And an example of those for COVID are the mRNA vaccines, the BioNTech vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and maybe others as well. Really very, very good vaccines at preventing even mild infections. And then on the right hand side, we have some vaccines that are maybe not so effective at preventing infection, but they are still very effective in limiting disease progression and still very effective in preventing severe outcomes. Now, depending on the strategy that we're choosing, if we're choosing the, the herd immunity strategy, we really need infection limiting vaccines. Uh, because those vaccines would also be able to limit onwards transmission of infection in the community. If we're aiming for the strategy where everybody should get vaccinated uh, and preferably sooner, then actually with whichever vaccine uh, that can prevent severe disease would be acceptable for such a strategy. Now in, in Hong Kong, I want to share some, some of my own data with you. I've been doing some studies in Hong Kong of of uh, infections in the community, although we don't have many, and also of antibody responses to vaccination. And in Hong Kong, we're using the BioNTech vaccine, uh, the mRNA vaccine, and we're also using the CoronaVac vaccine made by Sinovac, which is an inactivated virus vaccine. And so I, I'd like to share with you my data on antibodies after vaccination. I have two slides. The first slide here is showing the binding antibodies on the left-hand side with an ELISA for the receptor binding domain. And the right-hand side is showing surrogate virus neutralization, uh, which is a neutralization test done with a surrogate virus, not the real live SARS-2 coronavirus. The blue dots are the antibody values for people who receive BioNTech, and the red dots are the antibody values for people who receive CoronaVac from Sinovac, the inactivated virus vaccine. And I have data on the left before vaccination. And in Hong Kong, we have very, very few natural infections. So the pre-vaccination titers are, are very, very low. We have in the middle antibody titers after the first dose and before the second dose of vaccination. And on the right-hand side, we have the antibody titers after the second dose. This is an average of 21 to 28 days after the second dose of whichever vaccine the person received. And you can see in the first panel for the binding antibodies measured by ELISA, uh, this is the same laboratory doing the tests. So the only difference is which vaccine people choose. And these, I should also say these participants are healthcare workers. So they're typically middle-aged adults. There's a slight age difference in terms of the Sinovac recipients being slightly older, but not a very substantial age difference and a lot of overlap between the two groups. So on the left is the binding antibodies. We can see uh, a big difference with the, the people who receive even one dose of BioNTech having already quite a lot of antibodies on average. And after the second dose, really very high levels. And for the Sinovac, really the second dose is critical, but still only brings antibodies to a moderate level. On the right-hand side with the neutralization test, uh, where the limit is 100%, we can see after the two doses of BioNTech, people are reaching the ceiling of this assay. The antibodies are off the charts. You could say really very high levels of antibodies, whereas for Sinovac, there's moderate levels of antibodies after the second dose. And you can see after the first dose, almost nothing. So maybe some of you have seen in the media reports from Chile of an estimate of very low effectiveness of the Sinovac vaccine after the first dose. It's consistent with these antibody titers being very low after just one dose. Really, the second dose is necessary to bring antibodies up to a reasonable level. Now, this is my second slide. These are the neutralizing antibody titers against the live SARS-2 coronavirus. Uh, all these antibody tests are done by Professor Malik Pires, 
uh, his team in the laboratory in, in the University of Hong Kong. And these were done in our uh, biose biosecurity level three laboratory, the high security laboratory. And the results are consistent with the previous slide, uh, essentially for, for the neutralizing antibodies against live virus, people who receive two doses of BioNTech have very high levels of antibody, again, off the charts in some cases, and people who receive the Sinovac, the inactivated virus vaccine, uh, moderate levels of antibodies. Um, and at, from this uh, particular slide, you might even have the impression that one dose of BioNTech is superior to two doses of Sinovac in terms of the neutralizing antibody titers. Now, of course, I haven't presented data on the other components of the immune system, T cells, uh, ADCC antibodies, uh, maybe other things as well. But uh, we do think that neutralizing antibodies are a, a major part of uh, the immune response to vaccines and a major contributor to the protection conferred by these vaccines. And so, for example, uh, a study recently published in Nature Medicine proposed that the neutralizing antibody titers could be a correlate of protection. And because each clinical trial was done uh, with neutralizing titers in a different laboratory with different standards, they need to do some kind of normalization. And so that was a, a lot of work for this team. They did the normalization and put everything together on a single figure with, uh, with uh, the titers relative to, to the titers after natural infections. And you can see at the top right of this figure, high levels of neutralizing antibodies uh, linked to high levels of vaccine efficacy, 95% maybe for the, for the uh, mRNA vaccines. And then at the, the bottom left, you can see relatively more modest efficacy for the inactivated virus vaccines. And the Sinopharm vaccine is not shown here, but uh, would be also somewhere in the lower left of this slide. So the results that I've just presented from my own study in Hong Kong are very consistent with this picture that the antibodies are much lower in people who receive the inactivated virus vaccines. And from the clinical trials, we also saw lower clinical effectiveness. There's also a very obvious question about uh, what's the efficacy likely to be against variants like the Delta variant. And actually this figure can give us a clue. And I will add some arrows to this figure to show you what I mean. If the Delta variant reduces antibodies by 50%, by a half, so it drops antibodies to half the level that they were, then we can see what would that look like for the mRNA vaccine at the top, the green arrow on the top right of this slide. Uh, you can see it coming, if the titers come down by, by a factor of two, uh, the, the vaccine efficacy would be reduced perhaps from 95% to 90%. That's a loss of efficacy but uh, not a major, major loss. And I think the, the presentation from Professor Wilder-Smith did mention numbers like 90% against some of the variants. But if you look at the inactivated vaccine at the bottom, CoronaVac, if we were to drop the antibody titers by half, uh, the green arrow shows that the slope in that region is much steeper. And so there's the potential for a much greater loss. I would say 20%. Uh, loss in efficacy from maybe 50% to maybe 30%. Now, having said that, that's the efficacy against infection. And it may well be that these vaccines still have high efficacy against severe disease and death, and will still save many lives, whichever vaccines are used, because the priority right now is to vaccinate as many people as possible. But I think we do have to be prepared for lower clinical efficacy of the inactivated virus vaccines compared to some of the other vaccines that are available for COVID. So uh, in my own study, uh, both vaccines led to increases in antibody titers, but the, the increases were much more substantial for people who received two doses of the BioNTech vaccine. I didn't include data on other potential correlates of, of protection for vaccines like T cells, ADCC antibody. I'm still collecting more and more data every week, every month. And I do have some, some data coming on, on those as well, but not today. Uh, those are still in preparation. And the, the last point I made is that uh, protection against infection is likely to be reduced versus various. Now, I have a few more slides to share before I pass to the next speaker. Um, I, I was asked to mention quickly how to estimate field effectiveness of vaccines. And one of the most common ways to do that is with what's called a test negative study design. The figure on the, on the right hand side illustrates the concept We'll find some patients, whether it's in a hospital or in, a, in an outpatient clinic, 
Uh, the example here was for influenza, so we have sentinel ILI patients, but the same, uh, the same concept applies for COVID. We'll swab them and then we'll test them, and the test positives are compared with the test negatives, and we look at vaccination history. The test data design has been increasingly used not only for influenza, but for other infections, and, and uh, we published a review of this last year, a review of how the test native study is being used for, for these other infections, and I think it will be used for COVID and has already been used for COVID uh, in, in a number of published studies. There's some limitations we need to be careful of though. How, uh, what's the setting for the studies? And there's, there's different issues in the hospitals, different issues in community clinics. Um, there's some, um, some features of the test design we need to be careful of. And one of them is the, the, the issue of confounding. And so a specific example of that is if we have a group prioritized for earlier vaccination like healthcare workers, they may also have a higher risk of infection and we need to take that into account, need to take into account that they have this occupational status, putting them, a, uh, giving them a higher chance to get vaccinated, but also a higher chance of infection. Otherwise, we may come up with the wrong estimate of vaccine effectiveness. And some other issues are on this slide as well. The last one, once vaccine coverage gets higher, there may be indirect effects uh, and that can be difficult to deal with in uh, the test negative design. Happy to discuss more of this. Uh, in the Q&A or also at a later date. And my last comment, because I have a, a commentary that will appear tonight in a, in a journal, is the idea of fractionation. And it's a very simple idea. It was done for yellow fever. Uh, the idea is if you have 2 million doses of vaccine, you can give two doses to 1 million people because then you need those 2 million doses. So 1 million people get two doses each. What about if we give half doses? What about if we give two half doses to 2 million people? So we double the number of people, but everybody gets half as much vaccine. They get two half doses. So of course, individual protection could be lower, but if you look at the figure on the right-hand side, if like for most vaccines, the protection has a concave relationship with the dose, uh, giving half a dose to twice as many people would actually be better at the population level, especially with shortages of vaccines and I'm sure it could save <clears throat> lives. Uh, it was successfully done for yellow fever vaccines. It's been done for other vaccines as well, uh, but it hasn't been discussed to my knowledge for COVID-19 and I don't know why. So I have a paper coming out tonight to, to raise this question of why hasn't it been considered. And I'm not suggesting that we start it tomorrow. I'm suggesting that we at least <laughs> collect some data and think about it because think of all the lives that, that potentially could be saved. If you remember, the AstraZeneca trial that was done with a half dose followed by a full dose, the efficacy was 90%. It was a small trial, but um, I think it deserves more attention than it's been given. And with that, I will finish. Uh, this work was done together with uh, Professor Malik Pieris and, and Professor Gabriel Lung and others. And thank you for my funding as well. And thank you very much. I will stay for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Professor. Excellent presentation, a lot of stimulating uh, thoughts, ideas. I'm sure there'll be lots of comments and questions, and I can see already on the chat box, many questions are coming to you. So please stay on the call with us. Yeah, thank you very much once again. Now we come to the third scheduled speaker today, Dr. Vinod Kumar Bura. Dr. Bura is currently the epidemiologist in the WHO in Nepal. However, he's been there only a few days, and most of his work until he came to Nepal was in Indonesia and he oversaw the vaccination program in Indonesia until two weeks ago. I think he was there about at least uh, half a dozen years. Dr. Bura, I would like to respectfully invite you to make your presentation. Please. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Abikon, and uh, greetings from uh, Kathmandu. Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, also, my greetings to my previous two speakers for a very informative and um, spiking uh, presentation. So I will be talking about uh, steps from vaccine development to the jabs in arms, because our scientists have done a wonderful job of getting us the COVID vaccines, different types of vaccines, all these different variations that we heard. But the another challenge is how to get these vaccines uh, vaccinated to the population that we want to protect. So uh, let me just share my screen and thank you. Yeah.
So, so my presentation will take very, very quickly something on the background of the work that was going on in Indonesia, uh, a quick slide on Indonesian situation. It is one of the few countries where there's a steep increase in cases. How did we prepare for vaccination and its implementation challenges and some of the summary or, or observations in this work, you know. Um, colleagues, you all must be knowing Indonesia is a huge country with thousands of islands and, and geographically very difficult to, to vaccinate and reach all populations on spread over 17,000 islands. But predominantly, 50% of Indonesia's population lives on the Java island. This, this uh, red part, which I have, uh, this is the place where majority of the population lives. And in the rest of the area, the population is quite remote and, and scattered. You know. It has a decentralized uh, governance system, which also makes some additional challenges for our implementation. Uh, we heard from our previous speakers how the variants are causing a havoc in parts of the world and Indonesia is not left untouched. We are having a steep rise in cases in Indonesia in the last couple of weeks. And, and uh, as we speak, we have more than 2.3 million cases and unfortunately, over 61,000 deaths in the country. And it's not in one particular part, almost all parts of the country are seeing an increase in cases, which is very worrisome. And also we are seeing the new Delta variant in Indonesia, which is causing a havoc out there. So in, in, with this current setting, Indonesia is uh, progressing towards vaccinating and we have used the global guidance of of a vaccine deployment plan, which has these 13 elements. And we carefully went through them and planned uh, before we started our vaccination. Uh, we had a very strong uh, commitment from the government. Uh, the president led the national coordination committees and uh, different task groups and uh, technical committees were assigned. The government uh, did allocate significant funding for the COVID vaccination part. And, and hence, uh, what I would say, there's a strong ownership from the national government. I would again reiterate the importance of developing these technical tools and policy documents well in advance and making them robust and live. Change them as per the programmatic needs. Change as situation evolves, you know, and that's very much essential for a successful uh, implementation of the program. Prior to the launch of vaccine, we were apprehensive over the vaccine acceptance. So Indonesia did an online vaccine, online survey where more than 115,000 people above the age of 18 participated in, in an online survey uh, to look into people's acceptance, whether people will take vaccine and what are the concerns people have. And, and no big surprises, we saw that the, the acceptance of vaccine, the yes was 64.8%. The no's were around 7.6%, but there was a junk of a significant population, 27.6, which were the fence sitters and which were not sure whether they should vaccinate, take the vaccine or not to take the vaccine. So this survey helped us to design some of our policies and some of our strategies uh, in different parts of the country. And the survey showed the acceptance from somewhere between 45% to 74% across the country, but nowhere in the country it was 100%, clearly saying that there was lots of work to be done in order to convince people to take the vaccines. And at that point of time, we did not know what vaccines will come. And subsequently, a number of vaccines have come, which have also created a number of issues because someone says this is good, someone says that is good. So those additional challenges that we faced. We looked at different religious groups, how they are preferring the vaccines, and we could see some clearly some challenges in some parts of, of our community uh, where we had to do some additional work for, for acceptance of vaccine. You know? And the reasons why they don't want vaccines, safety, not sure uh, of the effectiveness, fear, some religious beliefs. So these, these were common issues that came out and, and uh, and this all constitutes the vaccine hesitancy, which is a global problem. And we, the government and all the partners started working rigorously to address this issue before the launch of the vaccination program. Indonesia was the first country in Southeast Asia to launch its vaccination on 13th January uh, using the Sinovac vaccine uh, from, from China. And they, they Indonesia, with a population of about 260 billion, plans to vaccinate 181 million, which is around about 65 to 68 percent of population, in order to reach a herd immunity. We are understanding more about these vaccines, and we may not be sure about these numbers of where we will reach herd immunity. But the plan was to vaccinate this this population in a prioritized framework and and provide vaccines free of cost to all the population. 
on the honorable president did visit certain um, simulation exercises that showed the government's highest commitment in order to uh, um, prepare for the vaccines uh, rollout. And uh, this is how we, we planned uh, in three different stages to vaccinate our, our community. Health workers were our key priority, then the essential workers, followed with, with older people above 60 with and without comorbidity, then other risk people. And uh, of late, we are talking about vaccinating children uh, in Indonesia also. The Honorable President was the first recipient of the first vaccine in the country, which was telecast live. And along with President, the entire cabinet and 50 prominent people of the country were vaccinated with a strong message to give confidence to the community to accept the vaccine, which is, which was, uh, which is safe and efficacious for, for the population. Till date, Indonesia has vaccinated 45.8 million people in the country. Uh, 45.8 million doses have been provided using three different types of vaccine, predominantly Sinovac, which is 83% of the coverage from Sinovac, 15% from AstraZeneca, and around about 0.5% from Sinopharm vaccine, which have been rolled out in the country. And again, uh, uh, these are the different uh, categories of people, health workers, uh, which you see on the extreme left hand side, top corner, you see first and second dose is almost 100%. Uh, but the, the concern is of the elderly people with only 22% having received first dose and around 13% receiving second dose. So as we go forward, uh, we have different challenges in order to vaccinate and equitably re reach vaccines to, to, to our vulnerable population out here. Again, I just wanted to show the trends. You know, it was initially a slow start of vaccination, picked up somewhat, and then again, holidays and uh, uh, religious events do have an impact on vaccination coverages. Weekends have an impact. So countries which are planning for vaccination need to factor all these issues. Currently, we are vaccinating about, about half a million doses per day, but that is not sufficient given the huge target the country has. We need to segregate the data and see, although in my previous slide I showed health workers are almost 100% vaccinated, but if I break it down by districts, there are still 82 districts in the country which have less than 85% coverage for health workers for first dose. And there are 162 districts with less than with less than two doses in the country for health workers. So again, in spite of numbers looking good overall, break it down by subnational district level to see where are the gaps. And these are the pockets where transnational will prevail and, and you will have difficulties. Uh, I want to reiterate this fact that prepare in advance and in detail. Check availability and standards of your cold chain. Utilize the private sector. This is a gigantic task. Countries have not vaccinated this many number of people in, in nearby uh, last couple of years. So it's a huge task for countries. We need to prepare, take uh, support from all possible uh, sectors. Health workers' knowledge on COVID disease and vaccine, both has to be enhanced. Plus, about all the other issues like the variants, the different type of vaccines, the health workers must be able to convince the community. Do's and don'ts are very helpful in local language for health workers. Prepare flyers for community to make them understand the importance of vaccine and why they should vac get vaccinated and what are the other public health measures they need to put into place even post-vaccination. Engagement with community is essential, I would say. Vaccinated persons should be encouraged to mobilize their neighborhoods and bring others who are unwilling or, or in doubt, you know. And people with disabilities, sick, marginalized population, migrants are most likely to be missed. In jails, inmates in jail, they are most likely to be missed. We need to keep a special track on these kind of population to ensure that we vaccinate. Elderly vaccination is a key priority. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get all the elderly. Some of them are don't, they need transport. They don't have anybody at home to help them. So special strategies or campaigns must be launched and take vaccine as close as possible to the community to vaccinate them. Look at this, I mean, inequities. Although Indonesia has vaccinated significantly 21% of its population with one dose of for elderly and around about 14% uh, for second dose. But if I break it down by provinces, there are huge inequities in the country. So, so these, these inequities will keep on resulting in deaths of our elderly uh, population happening because they are not getting the vaccine. And strategies need to be put into place to accelerate coverages before we open the window of vaccination for other population to, to ensure that these populations are reached and protected in time. 
again on job training because we are involving more number of health workers uh, health workers who are traditionally not giving vaccines we are involving they need some tips and do's and don'ts are very important for them hoax is a real problem in this world with social media being so active indonesia has a very high user of uh, uh, internet and social media it's very important to address pro proactively the hoax news monitor what is happening on social media what is being reported and be ahead in the game to to respond to these uh, hoaxes also the vaccine safety is a huge concerns media social media reports unrelated events it's very important for for the authorities to be open transparent and proactive and and share results of all adverse events or potentially events which have happened with the media and brief media periodically not only on events but even without events brief media make sure that they are on your side of understanding religious leaders endorsement is critically important in a in a country which like indonesia and it's very important they are on board and they understand the value of vaccination and they issue necessary directives to the to the community to get vaccinated innovations are needed to reach this community whether it's drive through vaccination vaccination in malls vaccination in offices vaccination in factories we need to think out of the box to go beyond our traditional vaccination strategies and approaches to reach to these communities it's a gigantic task and all sectors and all possible help is needed to to uh, to reach this population again we have to understand people are not available at all times so we have to adjust our vaccination sessions according to availability of people we are using vaccines which have no vvms it's essential very important that many of these vaccines are cold chain sensitive important to monitor the cold chain using um, newer electronic uh, uh, tools wastage has to be monitored uh, coverage not only the overall coverage but coverage of certain groups like teachers health workers essential staff all these coverages has to be monitored separately and stratified at a lowest level to see we are reaching all all essential people whenever there is a vaccination started or a new vaccine comes there are increase in rumors there is increase in hoax on social media needs to be properly handled and and proactively responded and all, as i mentioned private sector needs to be um, uh, used to speed up coverages some observations from the field initially when we saw was it takes a lot of time to vaccinate there is a screening process there is a vaccination there is a 30 minute post vaccination so it takes a significant time hospital nurses are trained to give injections to for uh, the antibiotics or other matters but they are not trained to respond to give vaccines although the techniques are there but certain messages like post vaccination you will have fever malaise you can have a slight headache or or you you will feel lethargic these messages must be told to everybody otherwise people come back to the hospital complaining that post vaccination they are they are having some problems and adverse events are unnecessary being reported softwares are excellent tools to speed up but they don't work everywhere elderly are not comfortable using registration online do have alternate apps to monitor and keep the option of manual registration at least for the elderly population if possible only use one type of vaccine in one session we have seen mix up of vaccines we have seen people who got one dose for a particular brand and the second dose from a second brand unintentionally because of of uh, of a session having multiple doses or a people going to different sessions for second dose health health centers work will get disturbed when covid vaccination takes place that's why it's very important that we we keep a track of of uh, how our other programs are going on and health staff and public are really concerned about afis they are concerned about the news of blood clots being reported in most medias they are concerned of why vaccination drive was stopped in x number of countries so we need to prepare and update their knowledge on these important points people do compare vaccine efficacy of different vaccines and uh, moderna versus mrna vaccine versus sinovac so we need to enhance our health workers knowledge how to address these critical points you know so in in my conclusion i would say there are some enablers how uh, which has helped countries roll out vaccination commitment of national government has been very good we have seen excellent support by partners the covax facility has been an excellent example although it still needs vaccines 
We've capacity of country has been supported by number of partners, World Bank, UNICEF, and name it, everybody has been there to support countries. Experience of large scale measles rubella campaign and other vaccine campaigns has was found to be helpful in planning stages. And, and governments were, were, I would say, well prepared when we talked about vaccinating large number of people. Polio staff and polio infrastructure was also very useful in terms of quickly uh, putting uh, uh, the surveillance network in place. And we are seeing high utilization of available vaccines. Now the challenges that we see is limited and unpredictable supply of vaccine is a huge concern. Multiple source of vaccine and multiple types of vaccine raises safety concerns and people's perception. Rumors and adverse events monitoring is very important. And COVID has highlighted the inequities in the current health systems and widely inequities and putting pressure on families. The poorest and the marginalized people are somewhat not being able to get vaccinated. Vaccination and poorage is deprived, I would say, and budget costing and resource mapping is fully not planned because we really don't know how much we have to vaccinate, 60%, 80%, all depends on how situation will evolve. You know. And this is my final slide that implementation of COVID has been quite challenging. However, there has been a strong commitment from all levels, I would say. Understanding of the prioritization by sub-national government district has to be ensured. They tend to jump the gun and start vaccinating healthy people or families and other people. So we need to ensure that we fully make everybody understand. Identifying priority population, elderly population is very important and difficult. Either we identify through the insurance schemes or through other programs or through screening, but we have to identify this population Again, monitoring the entire operation of vaccine, vaccination, logistics, needs additional manpower, needs resources, and responding to new waves of outbreak variant is likely to raise more concerns and people's concern on, on acceptance of vaccine. And that we are seeing after we have news of vaccinated people getting reinfected. So this is a concern we need to address. Handling of AFI and adverse event of special interest in population is is uh, is very important as we roll out this new vaccine and issues of post vaccination reinfection needs proper scientific briefing and education of our health workers and frontline staff so that they can respond to the community and and give them a clear answer as to what and why it has happened you know so thank you very much for the patience sharing and i would like to acknowledge the government of indonesia and ministry of health for their data and for their kind permission to share this information Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bora. All the all the practical lessons and experience that you shared uh, with regard to Indonesia, I'm sure it will be useful for all our colleagues in Sri Lanka also. Lessons that you learn from Sri Lanka, I'm sure there'll be some other questions for you. I see some questions already. We'll come to them in the next round. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had three excellent presentations each one complementing the other and uh, shared a lot of information, many ideas and a lot of food for thought. We have taken down all the questions or most of the questions which appeared in the chat. Uh, my colleague has done that for us. I don't know how we do that. I mean, some of the questions are obviously for Annalise when you're, when you're talking, there are questions on the chat. Then um, about five or six questions we have which are addressed to Dr. Professor Kauli and a couple to Dr. Bura. Now, I don't know whether we should, I'll, I'll, I'll spread it around, know that, you know, I'll spread it around if that is all right. So can I start off uh, with Professor Annalise with some of these, when we finish this, if anyone wants to say something, we can uh, provide some time depending on how late we are, how early we are. Professor Annalise, uh, questions that uh, directed uh, to you during your presentation, I'll mention a couple of them and you can address them all together. What's the efficacy of Sinopharm against Delta variant? Can you hear me? Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, then what is the data on efficacy of Sputnik, Sinopharm and Sinovac on Delta variant? I think Professor Cowling also will like to, to, to respond to this uh, next time when it, when it comes to next round. What vaccines can be given as a second dose for those who got the AstraZeneca vaccine as a first dose? With a long time gap between the first and second dose having effect. This is a very, very Sri Lankan question because, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have had a long gap for some of the people who took the first dose. 
it's been about now more than 16 weeks. So naturally there is a little uh, anxiety and uh, impatience about that. But this question is uh, for one of you. One more, I'll, I'll mention one more and then we can take a few responses from you. Can there be non-responders to COVID vaccine? No antibodies and what can we do in that case? So I'll leave them to you. Annalise, you can start and uh, Professor Ben Cowling, would you also like to contribute to, to uh, supplement the answers? Then we'll come to the next, next round after that. Okay, please. So I will start with a question on Sinopharm and, and, and uh, Sputnik and, and Sinovac in terms of uh, their protection against Delta. So because Delta is relatively new, um, uh, there are no data for Sinopharm and Sinovac that I know of. Um, the, the, the data, the good data are now from the mRNA vaccines and, and AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson just has had a preprint. Um, so for Sinovac, I do know that there are data for the P1, which is still well preserved. So yes, we absolutely need more um, vaccine effectiveness data for all the vaccines, including Sinopharm and Sinovac. The um, the next question was, um, or oh, maybe I'll just uh, add the Barat. Barat produced um, an, ex an inactivated vaccine called Covaxin BBB, I think fifty two, um, yes. which is an inactivated vaccine, but but includes a, a TLR which uh, increases the Th one bias. So it probably is a stronger or more robust vaccine than than Sinopharm and Sinovac. And, 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 and they have just uh, published, I think also as a preprint, that their, um, their effectiveness against um, Delta is also relatively preserved. Relatively preserved means, you know, maybe reduced by five to 10%, which we, I think, can all live with. The second dose issue is an important pressing <laughs> policy issue. Um, it, it really became pressing because COVAX is highly uh, uh, reliant on Covishield AstraZeneca. But because of the Indian national crisis, as you know, the exportation was discontinued. So many countries were left in the dilemma that they could not give their second dose. Um, so we pub so, so WHO published a document showing that for AstraZeneca, even if you wait uh, for a long time, that the efficacy remains relatively stable after a first dose, remembering that a first dose always has a reduced effectiveness compared to two doses. But the effectiveness after a first dose of AstraZeneca is still relatively high also against severe disease or most importantly against severe disease because of a very strong T cell response. And so from the UK, we have these post introduction observational data that show that even with 12 and longer uh, time interval, uh, your vaccine effectiveness is relatively stable and remains around 80, 70 to, uh, 70 to 85%. There's always a range because it depends on age and comorbidities and various other factors. So based on that, um, you know, WHO said, well, if you can't get your second dose within eight to 12 weeks, yes, you can wait for 16 weeks and maybe longer, but we do not have data beyond 16 weeks. So I, this is now, you know, you, know, you want to be evidence-driven. But um, meanwhile, um, the UK, Germany, and Spain have published data on what we call heterologous priming schedules. These are mix and match studies with different combinations. And different combinations are still ongoing, but what is published is currently the combination of AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer. Uh, it does seem to have a higher reactogenicity <laughs> after the second dose, but it also is associated with a better immunogenicity. So it's very encouraging. Indeed, you can mix two platforms. And it's currently being done, I can tell you, in many of the European countries. Germany has a policy to give a first dose AstraZeneca followed by a second dose uh, mRNA vaccine. 
So this is the answer to the second question. I think I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Professor Kaolin, do you have anything to add to what Annalise just said? Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, just one thing to add. I'll, I'll share this slide again. Uh, so without data on clinical efficacy against variants, maybe the only thing we can look to is neutralizing titers. And so if a, if a variant is linked to reduced titers, for example, by a half, then I think this figure indicates uh, how the protection might change. Of course, we would like to have field data on vaccine effectiveness to be sure, but uh, until then we'll have uh, this, you could say prediction, and if, if there's a stronger change, like for the South African variant with a fourfold drop in titers, you can see there's the potential for a large loss in protection uh, compared to the wild type virus. So that would be my response to the question of protection against variants. Uh, in simple terms, all vaccines will lose some protection, but those that start at a lower level of protection will lose more. So the inactivated vaccines have the potential to lose a lot of effectiveness fairly quickly with variants, whereas the, uh, the more effective vaccines have uh, more insulation, you could say it that way, against variants. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bura, I'll come back to you. Oh, you want to add something now? Um, Professor, maybe at a later stage. Thank you. Yeah, I'll come back to you. There are a few questions for you also directly. Um, the next question is uh, goes like this. Vac vaccines with marginal effectiveness, around 60%, are unlikely to lead to appreci appreciable herd immunity. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's certainly correct. Yeah. But as I yeah. said in my talk, as yeah. I said in yes. my talk, I yes. think that the, the strategy we're looking for is vaccinating everybody. Everybody has their yeah. own protection because we can't rely on herd immunity. And the, and the question that the second part of the question is, uh, what is the exact percentage that has to be immunized to acquire herd immunity in these cases, depending uh, on, for, the, on the percentage? Yeah, for, for yeah. Delta yeah. variant with a high transmissibility, I think we'll have to have a level of immunity in the population of at least 80%. Mm -hmm. That's impossible with a vaccine that has less than 80% efficacy. But remember, we get immunity in the population, not only from vaccinations, but also from infections. infections. If you have a lot of infections already and you add on top of that, even inactivated vaccines, you can still yeah. reach that 80% threshold. And actually herd immunity is the natural destination of any epidemic, any infectious disease. At the end, in, in a few years time, we'll have herd immunity from COVID, but I hope that it will be largely from vaccinations and post-vaccination infections rather than the alternative of, of large unmitigated epidemics. Uh, so, so all vaccines will help and uh, it's gonna be tough to reach herd immunity. I think the strategy of giving everybody vaccine to protect themselves is likely to be what, what most parts of the world end up with. Maybe so to add- Yes, uh, please. So please. to add, there is no exact number. There's no exact threshold. It depends on the vaccine characteristics. So vaccine with lower effectiveness yeah. will need yeah. a higher coverage. With yes. mRNA vaccines with a lower coverage, you can achieve a, a real you know, suppression of the epidemic. And it will also depend on the variant of concern that is currently circulating. Yeah, OK, thank you. I think this question also probably uh, I should address this to Professor uh, Ben Kowling. China has principally used inactivated vaccines. What do the available data indicate about vaccine efficacy in China? Uh, very little data on vaccine efficacy in China because they have so few cases. They have only handfuls of cases, most recently an outbreak in Guangzhou with hundreds of cases, but still not enough to really have a good idea of vaccine effectiveness in the field. We just have antibody titers because there's so few infections in China. So we'll rely on other parts of the world for the vaccine effectiveness data. There's a follow-up question after that. How did China manage to control COVID so effectively? It's a long well, answer, I think. You will have to go long <laughs> answer. Very, very brief answer. They yeah. acted relatively quickly and very, very forcefully 
And in China, interventions are possible, which are not possible in most other parts of the world, including very stringent social distancing and very impressive contact tracing using mobile phone tracking, CCTV facial recognition, all sorts of other things to really track down contacts and then use all of the uh, government infrastructure for isolation, quarantine, and of course, the community measures. So they, they, they are in a better position to control COVID and to keep it under control uh, than most other parts of the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben. Dr. Bura, there's a question for you. I think uh, you will be able to throw some light on this. Have you got any data on the efficacy of Sinovac in Indonesia? The kind of data that we got from a, the small sample in Hong Kong that Professor Kowling presented. Have you got any data on Sinovac uh, in Indonesia and any studies at all? Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, this is a very important topic and quite well debated in Indonesia and the government wants to do a vaccine effectiveness study uh, on, on this vaccine. Uh, but as of now, except from the initial data um, by which this vaccine was approved, there is no new data on vaccine efficacy for Sinovac. Only the, the WHO data, is it? Yes. Maybe I can yeah, add this? here. Sorry. Maybe Are I can add. Yeah, Chile has um, used Sinovac yeah, yeah. in a large scale, and yeah. they indeed did a, a very rigorous um, post-introduction vaccine effectiveness study with a national cohort involving more than 10 million. Those were presented to WHO, they are in the WHO background papers, but they will also be published soon, and they look um, consistent with the phase three trial results in that, you know, the effectiveness against symptomatic mild disease remains around 50 to 60%, but the effectiveness against death and hospitalization is far above 80%. Um, so, so it did have impact in Chile. Yeah, brother Ben, uh, that's, that's the question. China has vaccinated only about 15%, is it? At the moment, fully vaccinated, or is it more? Oh, the, the vaccine coverage has shot up in the last two months. It's shot Indeed. up. So now they are above uh, 50%, I believe. And in some cities is 70% fully vaccinated, uh, okay. even, even higher. They've done a lot in the last one or two months, a lot, accelerated very rapidly on vaccination. Uh, then there's another question. I think I'll address it to, to, to any one of the three of you. Since the vaccine efficacy varies so much, we will have people with good vaccines and other, others with bad vaccines. How do we deal with this? <laughs> can, you, can you respond to that? It is, it is in fact, uh, becoming uh, real, true, yeah. Is there any way to deal with that? I don't know. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cowling? No, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think... What we've seen is all the vaccines are very good at limiting severe disease. And when breakthrough infections have occurred, they've been generally mild. Uh, but having said that, there are still some severe in breakthrough infections, especially in places where there are many, many infections. Of course, there will be some severe, unfortunately. Um, in the future, I don't think it would be so important to know which vaccine you receive. Right now, we have vaccine passports being discussed everywhere in the world, but in, in, in the future, I think that, that won't yeah, be necessary. Yeah, that's, that's becoming a problem, yes. Yeah, that right now is a problem, of yeah, course. Yeah, to go yeah. to Europe, you yeah. have to have a vaccine on their list and, yeah. and they have a list, but I think within, within a year or two, it wouldn't that's be good. such a big issue. They wouldn't mind because it's no big deal anymore. So that's only a short-term issue, not a long-term issue. Yeah, but I think one of the messages that we we are left with from what uh, all three of you said is that we should try and give as much as possible, as fast as possible, whichever vaccine that we can get, right? Is that is that a message that we can take from here, uh, Annalise? So, you know, there are a lot of factors that need to be considered by policymakers. And that's not only the efficacy. It is also the convenience 
it's the it's the cold uh, cold chain requirements it's the cost it's the safety issues um so so you have to weigh up all the factors so don't rely on efficacy alone i must say you know we do know that the inactivated vaccines have a lower efficacy against mild disease there will be more breakthrough we know that but they are easier to give they don't have a cold chain they are relatively safe we have not heard any you know real safety concerns and 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 so so programmatically they are faster to give than some of the other vaccines in the future we may need to you know when, when now access becomes easier countries have to reconsider their priorities and and their and their factors they want to consider when they decide which vaccine to use uh, how uh, how another question is about this the idea that came from uh, from ben uh, to give half doses uh, of vaccines to get wider coverage etc what do you have to say about that analysis and also uh, dr bura yes so i uh, it, it, it's, it's a it's, i mean it's a new idea but uh, since it came up uh, somebody has asked whether it's something that we can get a little bit more light on yeah it, it, it is really not such a new idea, and uh, but we need more data before you decide on this. So for Moderna, they have finished their trials using half the dose, uh, and it but it has to go through a regulatory process before we can um, we can then use it in in public policy. So it's likely that Moderna will from the hundred microgram go to the fifty microgram. Now I must say there are different ways of dose sparing. Dose sparing is half in the dose or giving intradermal versus intramuscular. I must say for the mRNA vaccines, they need, as far as I understand, they do need the myocytes, and I do think that they will need an intramuscular application. That said, obviously, as academics, we need to do more research and find out whether also for the mRNA vaccines, we can use an intradermal application. Um, so so the, the discussion about dose sparing will continue. But yeah. just to show you the discussion, we had it for the mRNA vaccines, where, we, you know, where there's currently a three to four weeks interval. And we said, it is better to give one dose to more people then two doses to half of the population. And therefore, yeah. countries like the UK, Canada, they decided to extend the interval between the two doses for the mRNA vaccines, even in the lack, in the absence of data at the time. For AstraZeneca, we do have data that a 12 weeks interval, in fact, is probably better than a four weeks interval. So yeah. dose sparing is, 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 a, is an important issue. Anything else that you need to add to that, uh, Dr. Gura? I think, we... sir, um, uh, yeah. in, in, in past, we have seen uh, use of intradermal vaccine or fractional dose for polio, for IPV polio, and also for the rabies vaccine. And that had uh, addressed some of the shortcomings or the shortages of IPV vaccination uh, in the global polio eradication program. I think it's, it's a great matter of research and interest. If it, it also lowered down the cost of the program. Uh, by using uh, such such innovative methods, you know. So we, as we, I think, uh, as the researchers will guide us further, we might see some of these innovations being used in COVID vaccination also. Uh, on one point, I wanted to mention: Indonesia has vaccinated around about 38, uh, do, 38 billion doses of Sinovac vaccine, and they have seen some breakthrough cases: uh, uh, patient uh, vaccinated population getting reinfected. Mostly, uh, most of them were after one dose. And the second dose reinfections were uh, health workers who were within the 14 days window of second dose of vaccination. And there were some cases uh, of uh, reinfection after two full dose and 14 days, but those cases were generally mild in, uh, in nature and required very little hospitalization. And a very few unfortunate deaths have taken place, but those had comorbidities associated uh, in, in such cases, you know. So uh, I think uh, for uh, use of uh, inactivated vaccine, I think the, the interval should not be increased. We should rapidly give both the doses uh, as prescribed within 28 days, 28 days window and uh, 
uh, country is also using other vaccines like AstraZeneca and in those populations, the, the vaccine window can be enhanced to 12, 12 weeks or beyond, you know, uh, to ensure that we spread out the vaccine widely and protect the country as quickly as possible uh, against. And we have Delta variant uh, tra uh, transmission here in Indonesia, along with other variants. And there are also some uh, local variants of uh, interest in Indonesia, which are coming up. Thank you. Yeah, you answered the other question also. That is uh, that was uh, earmarked for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bura. Uh, we have uh, finished most of the questions which appeared on the chat box. There are a few left, but I think we can leave it for a while. Now, what I want to, to, to decide uh, and what, what I want your help is whether anyone likes to ask any question and then or make a comment very quickly. We don't have much time, but we can allow a few questions or comments uh, from whoever is uh, on this call. If you can indicate by, by putting a hand up, we can spend another 10, 15 minutes at the most, I'm told, yeah. Shall we start? Um, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Anton Sebastian, it's your turn. Can you quickly ask a question or comment? 30 seconds. Please. You have to un unmute yourself. Yeah, I have. Yeah. What about the third dose? The third dose of these vaccines? Third dose of the vaccine. So there are, this is an important question. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there are studies for all the vaccines about to document the, doc the, the duration of immunogenicity, but also of vaccine, clinical vaccine effectiveness. And based on that, a decision will be made on the, on the timing of the booster and which booster and whether the booster needs to you know, be adapted to the variants or whether a booster of, with the wild type um, virus, you know, the old vaccine, would just broaden the, the neutralizing ant antibodies to cover. I think the most pressing, though, is, is, um, is, is for Sinovac and Sinopharm. Yeah. We know from all other inactivated vaccines that they usually do need three doses, and we do. Uh, so I, th I think this is the question that needs to be answered first. We already have data from Johnson mRNA, etc., that duration is clearly beyond six six months, but we lack those data for Sinopharm and Sinovac. Uh, and I also can tell you there are now studies, what we call mix and match studies, also for Sinopharm and Sinovac, going on to show whether. A, an mRNA booster would help increase the vaccine effectiveness and the duration. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Annalise. We have a number of hands up. Uh, can I invite Dr. Prasanna Gunasena? Uh, you have a comment or a question, uh, Dr. Prasanna? Please. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, I think uh, just a small question. Now, so yeah. far, Sri Lanka, we have been using Covishield. Sputnik uh, and the Sinopharm in in majority of people, and at the same time we are starting from tomorrow Pfizer, and we have a possibility of getting down Sinovac also about 2.5 million doses within the month of July. So what is the what you know if we have a chance, what what is the recommendation of the expert panel whether we should go ahead and you know get it down, or we should you know go with the currently available vaccines. The way we are getting it, you know, just uh, just a practical question I'm asking about from their experience. Yeah, thank you, Prasant. Uh, uh, Analyst Ben, quick quick response to Dr. Prasanna's question. Yeah. You go first. Sorry. No, ben. over to you. Over ben. to you, Annalise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the response indeed is. Um, as many vaccines in as many, into as many arms as possible. Mm. Uh, we do know that the Pfizer has the highest efficacy against mild symptomatic disease. And we do know that Sinopharm and Sinovac has a lot of breakthrough mild disease. But, you know, in facing a pandemic where we now, not tomorrow, today we want to prevent deaths. We now yeah. need to use the tools that we have now and roll it out roll them out as quickly as possible. So my answer would be use them all. In maybe in the future, it could be that we will say for Sinovac and Sinopharm, maybe even for AstraZeneca, we will give 
Pfizer as a second dose or as a third dose. Um, so, so, but for now, I would just use whatever you have in your hands. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you. Anyone add something or not? Thank you very much. That's the answer I needed. I think yeah. uh, we usually say take the vaccine before the virus takes you. you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sebastian, Dr. Anton Sebastian. No, no, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I already yeah. asked. Yeah, of course. Yeah, please. You done already? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Lakmali? Dr. Lakmali? Samara Singha? Rosa Narada? Yeah. Unmute yourself, please, Narada. Narada? Yeah? Rosa Narada? No, yeah, right. okay. just a quick, yeah, you know, yeah. could, could natural infection be the third dose, especially in poor countries? Could natural infection act as the, the mm -hmm. dose, right, you know, in poor countries to build up herd immunity in the sense, uh, you know, you know they, they'll get mild infection, uh, not harmful to themselves, and their immunity might get boosted up. Could that be a strategy? Yeah, yes. do you like to take that question? Please, yeah, Annalise. Um, so natural infection can be the first dose, the second, and the third dose. <laughs> and, and so natural, and we know that natural, that the protection from natural immunity is good and lasts long. Yes, we do see breakthrough. Also, we do see natural reinfections. However, if your question is to me, should we use the natural infection as the third dose? My hope is that the pandemic will come down and that you will not be exposed to natural infections on a high level population basis. And so I hope in the future, we don't have that, that and, and we will probably need some boosters at some time, yeah. at some stage. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Ben, do you have anything to add or Dr. Bura? No, 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 nothing to add. Nothing to add. Thanks. Dr. Lakmali, you have a question? Yeah, I, I, actually, please, 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 yeah, please. I actually put my question in the chat also. Please ask, can you... I, I unmuted. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to know, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I wanted to know, uh, uh, after getting the second, uh, first and second AstraZeneca, some people are uh, not having any antibodies. So what are we supposed to do? Are we not protected or uh, where are we? Mm. When do you like to take that? Yeah, I think there's different reasons why some people may not have the antibodies. Uh, of course, if they're taking immunosuppressive medication or have some mm. other condition limiting their immunity, then we have seen that, that you have a weak immune response to vaccination. Otherwise, uh, some people are just maybe unlucky that their response isn't as good as others. And it's not clear. I don't think there's any clinical studies yet on what's the best strategy for those people. I know sometimes they'll get another dose, but um, th there's a limit. You, you can't keep doing again and again and again if, if people don't respond. And at the same time, it's possible that even without the antibody response, the person is actually still protected. It's possible with T-cell, some other component of immunity. So it may not be necessary to focus on the antibody and say, you got to keep vaccinating until until they get the antibodies up. It may not be necessary. So I'm not a medical doctor, but I, I would say maybe just just uh, don't don't spend too much time worrying about the low level of antibodies. Uh, once you follow the the recommendation of the two doses, um, then um, yeah, we'll we'll hopefully have some protection, even if it's not showing up in the antibodies. I don't know yeah. if Anna Leaves has uh, something. Uh, I agree with you, Ben. So for AstraZeneca, it has an extremely strong T cell response, and that is how it protects. Um, so, so in fact, there is no routine measurement to measure your response, and we do not, in WHO, does not recommend even testing whether you have responded. And then, because we do not have an immune correlate at this time. So, so I would not, I would not, I would not 
check anyone map the, the the immune compromise that is another problem and that's an individual medicine and that needs to be tackled and they probably i also agree with ben they will need more than two doses but we need to uh, uh, await more evidence and and policies of how to deal with with the immune compromise uh, thank you, Parita, thank you this is this Parita, this is Malik. Can I just quickly comment on yeah, that? Please, Malik. Yeah, I was going to yeah. invite you. Yeah, please so, carry on. Please. No, no. So, so just to point out that some antibody tests target the N protein, which is not the 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 the, the protein that is uh, used in the vaccines. So, if you don't use the right antibody test, uh, even with um, even with Pfizer, you can get a negative result. So you have to be careful what antibody test you are using. But I completely agree with what has been said that it is not really recommended to, to go around uh, testing uh, antibody uh, for antibody after vaccination. Over. I agree with Malik. Yes. WHO yes. even has a statement not to test. Dr. Boruga Pillay? Yes. Uh, I, I, this is a practical question uh, regarding Sri Lanka. There are still a lot of people who have got AstraZeneca as the first dose are waiting for the second dose. And with the vaccines available, uh, Dr. Prasanna Gunasena has already told the Elite panel what vaccines are available. What is the best one to give as a second dose if AstraZeneca second dose is not coming through for Sri Lanka? I hope the question is clear. Over. Question is clear. Question is very clear. Annalise? Uh... Yes, so we have good data on giving Pfizer as or an mRNA vaccine as a second dose, Pfizer or Moderna, it, it is associated with a higher reactogenicity. So, so people after the second dose with the heterologous have more local transient side effects, uh, but it's also associated with a probably even increased um, neutralizing antibodies. And from that point of view, um, combining AstraZeneca for, or Covishield followed by Pfizer or Moderna is um, acceptable. And we have now, and WHO has added this to their recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. Uh, uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Pratibha, whose hand I can see up? Yes, sir. So, yeah. Now, uh, as we know that these vaccines are effective and safe from the mother's side. So if we take the fetus or the baby, uh, uh, what, what about these COVID vaccines? Are they, how, how much effective and safe are they for the fetus and the babies? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to answer that? I'm, I'm happy to take, take that yeah, question. Why not? Why not? Yeah. So obviously we have to go by, by vaccine product and vaccine platform. Currently, all the vaccines used are non-life vaccines, so are therefore considered safe in, in pregnancy and may also protect the fetus. The strongest and most robust data we have now for the Pfizer, for the mRNA vaccines, where, where safety was shown and protection against the fetus. However, we must also acknowledge that, you know, these vaccines are quite reactogenic, you know, a lot of at least 10% will develop fever, chills, et cetera. So a, a woman, a pregnant woman has to make a very um, considerate benefit risk assessment um, for, for vaccination. So, so we, we would not, I don't think I would give a blank recommendation for all vaccines for all pregnant women, but if a pregnant woman is at increased risk, and we do know that pre of exposure, and we also know that pregnant women have a higher risk of complications compared to non-pregnant women of the same age or to pregnant women without COVID, therefore mm -hmm. we, do, we do recommend the use of the vaccine. Thank you. Anyone else likes to comment? No? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Annalise. May I now invite uh, Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, when when would and, you and Dr. Prasant next? Yeah. yeah when would Anand, you please. consider giving a third dose to a population? Now we see Bahrain, which has uh, immunized quite a large percentage of their population, has started giving the third dose. Now uh, in other countries where the percentage of vaccination may be much lower, is there any particular time? 
period where one has to consider a third dose. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Can uh, either Annalise, Ben, or Dr. Gura respond to that quickly? So the answer depends yeah. on the vaccine. Um, and uh, we do not have the answer for the mRNA vaccines or for AstraZeneca. In fact, at the moment, we do not recommend boosters. We need to see, we need to observe and document the vaccination over a longer time. Now for Sinovac and Sinopharm, we do know, so these are inactivated vaccines, we do know that the efficacy is not as high. Dr. Ben Howling showed, showed that the neutralizing antibodies are lower and they may benefit from a third dose, but we are not basing it on, on, um, on clinical trials. So I would have loved to see a clinical trial first before I give a policy recommendation for countries to give it to millions. But yeah. I do think it has no mistake in giving a third dose and the correct or the best timing is depends when you can really document a, you know the timing when when there's now a decay of antibodies but just extrapolating from other inactivated vaccines i could imagine that six months is a good timing thank you very much ben you want to add something to that or not no i think maybe even longer than six months because the priority is still giving people their first and their second jab not the third jab yet. So I, I, I would tend towards leaving it for longer for now, uh, even a year, because we still want to prioritize giving people their chance to get their first jab. And yeah. we still have limited supplies in, in many places. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Crisantos? Uh, just a Geneva? quick question yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, came from what Professor Anley said. She said that there is no absolute correlate between, uh, she, there is no immune correlate uh, with protection. You cannot measure an antibody, you cannot measure a T cell response, which says, okay, you are safe against COVID. Is this common for other vaccines? Say for example, like measles and so on. Does measles also have correlates like that? Uh, have no correlates like that? Or if we move into bacterial situations like diphtheria, do we still have correlates? I'm just sort of trying to see how, uh, how much of the basic science is sort of supporting this. This sort of seems to be something in the reverse in the sense we have clinical efficacy and then we try to work back to what is exactly happening in the body. I know it's not uh, particularly related to the disease, but this is something that probably some information needs to be given to understand what is happening. Thank you. There Thank is you, an, yeah. Alice? There's an incredible uh, amount of work going on to determine the immune correlate. And, I, and we are really getting there. It, and we do know that the level of antibodies does correlate, but we don't know the threshold and indeed what you suggested is correct you have to you, ha you look at clinical effectiveness and then you backtrack and try to determine the immune correlate so i do believe that in the very near future we will have a better understanding of immune correlates and and professor malik paris he may even want to add something here because this is clearly his field i'm not a basic scientist i'm epidemiologist um you may be over if he's still there to Malik. Yeah, Ben, and then uh, uh, Malik, you would like to add a word to the part yeah, from, uh, from me? I, I think yeah. it's, it's important to, to be clear. It's not that there's no immune correlate. There probably is. That The problem mm -hmm. is we haven't yet established it. So I showed one slide where neutralizing antibodies does yeah. look like it has correlation with the vaccine efficacy against infection. Yeah. I yeah. would imagine T cell is correlating with protection against severe disease. And there may be other markers as well. We just need to do more research and figure it out. For other vaccines, it may take yeah. years. It may have taken years before the correlates are established after vaccines begin to be used. We usually start with the efficacy and then later figure out the correlates of protection. So it's not unusual for COVID and there will be correlates most likely. We just need to, to figure out and establish them. And one of the problems, one of the problems is that for COVID, the lab tests being done are not standardized. So neutralization mm -hmm. tests are done 10, 20 different ways. 
in all the labs around the world. And it's not easy. If we say a neutralization titer of 20 is protective, that means a different thing in a different country because the lab is doing it in a different way. So I think standardization of the lab test is a critical step as well for, for colas of protection. Thank you. Malik, you want to add a quick word before we move to, and then close practically, possibly? Malik? Well, yes, very quickly. But so for example, the question uh, whether for other vaccines, so for, for, for influenza, uh, we know there is a particular antibody titer of one in 40 in a particular type of test called the hemagglutination inhibition test, which correlates with protection of half, 50% of the people who have that titer. So we are, as was said, I think by both Ben and Annalise, we are definitely on the way to getting there with COVID. Um, uh, indeed, there are two, two papers kind of out there as preprints, and uh, I'm pretty sure that we will, we will get there not in not too distant future. And, and uh, neutralizing antibody would be definitely one of the correlates. But as Ben said, uh, you know, the other question is standardizing these neutralizing antibodies. WHO has put out uh, uh, international standard, so that will also help. So we'll get there, but, but we are not there yet. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, sorry. Quick comment. Uh, yes, please. Once we get there, do you think then vaccines will be developed very much faster because we have the absolute correlate? What has been the past experience? I mean, like, for example, with the influenza vaccines. It may not help to develop brand new vaccines, but it will certainly help to improve the existing vaccines. And when we have the version 2.0 for Delta variant or other things, if we can rely on the correlate of protection to indicate how well the vaccine will work, it will speed it up. But I don't think we'll have brand new technologies uh, because each correlate protection actually would apply per perhaps for a specific vaccine. I can imagine we have a correlate protection for, for mRNA vaccine, maybe a slightly different correlate protection for AstraZeneca because it works in a slightly different way. So I think it will help with improving existing vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I think uh, possibly the last question, we must uh, bring this to a close. Uh, is that Dr. Harsha? You have a question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank Thank you. Yeah. The question is whether we have any data for vaccines blocking transmission, whether we have uh, data for vaccinated people, uh, uh, you know, uh, data, how, how effectively they block transmission of the virus. Yeah, maybe I, I take that question because I've just yeah. been working on the manuscripts, <laughs> reviewing the whole literature. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for, for the mRNA vaccines, we have an increasing robust body of evidence that does show uh, that these vaccines reduce <laughs> transmission. That does not mean 100% prevention, but it reduces transmission. So, and the, and the evidence is triangulated. One, viral shedding is lower. Two, um, there's an impact also on reducing asymptomatic infections. So you, if you have fewer symptomatic and asymptomatic infections, you do not have a uh, virus. Thank you. Sorry, can you? Annalise, you are mute, unmute. Right, Am I okay. okay again? Yes. It's okay. it's okay, sorry, yeah. So, so the first one, there's, there's a, a reduced viral shedding. Secondly, there's reduction in asymptomatic and symptomatic infections that it reduces the viral trans, um, circulation. Third, there's now also evidence on indirect protection of unvaccinated household contacts of vaccinated persons. So for mRNA vaccine, increasing evidence, yes, it reduces it, but not to 100%. For Sinovac, Sinopharm, no data on transmission. And in fact, I've not even seen data on, on reduction of asymptomatic infection. So, so we definitely need more work for the inactivated vaccines. For AstraZeneca, we do know also that there is reduced viral shedding and reduced um, asymptomatic infections. So this is encouraging. That means there will also be some indirect protection of unvaccinated persons. Uh, Thank but you. Thanks a lot. Ben, you have anything to add? No, that was great. That's what I, yeah. That's, that's yeah, I, I see uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, De Silva's hand up. I must, uh, before we close, I must give him a chance to ask any question or make a comment. 
Rajiv. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's for, doc, uh, for Professor Kowling. Uh, it's a hypothetical question, but I think it's an important question for Sri Lanka. Given the, the that graph that you showed, where uh, you predict that uh, if the Delta variant comes, uh, that with the Delta variant, there'll be a, quite a significant reduction in the neutralizing uh, antibody theta following Sinovac. Now, given that we have some problems with different vaccines, would you think that it would be sensible to have a lot of Sinovac coming into the country? Say, maybe 30, 40% of the vaccination be to be using the Sinovac. Do you think it's a sensible thing, particularly as the Delta variant is here? I, I think that the Sinovac will lose a lot of its efficacy against mild infection with the Delta variant. So there may still be a lot of breakthrough infections, but it should still have a good level, a high level of protection against severe disease. And that means it could save many, many lives, but there may be some other consequences if you use a vaccine, which doesn't seem to prevent mild infections very well. It may damage vaccine confidence, it may have other impact on, on the community, but I think it would save lives because all the vaccines we have have been shown to be more effective against severe disease than mild disease. So even if there's some loss of effectiveness against mild infection with Delta, there should still be some degree of protection against severe disease. And that means if the choice is between having a vaccine with moderate efficacy and no vaccine, then still you can benefit from having the vaccine with moderate efficacy. But I would be concerned about the issue of public confidence if there's many breakthrough infections. We've seen a lot of media coverage of, of places where there were breakthrough infections that were not really expected, the Seychelles, and then uh, more recently, Indonesia is in the news as well. And I think that can be a, a separate issue, but you do need to take that into account of what, what will happen and how you deal with it. Over. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gura, you want to add a word about uh, that question? No, I think that, that's, that's very valid that uh, still saves life, but yes, there will be programmatic issues of getting public confidence back on track uh, for a vaccinated person getting disease. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gura. I don't see any more hands. In any case, we have now uh, gone one and a half hours, uh, two hours. We have gone two hours now. Uh, doc, Dr. Padma, would you like to close? Uh, shall I say thank you very much and uh, shall you close? Why, do, why didn't you say a few words and be close? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that we have we had an excellent pro, uh, uh, program uh, and it was a, a real uh, sort of it refreshed the knowledge. Uh, updated all of us with regard to the facts on vaccination and it uh, solved, I think, uh, uh, many issues that were uh, sort of uh, in our hands with regard to making, uh, placing orders for vaccines and things like that. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I need to, while I'm thanking all the speakers for their excellent presentations and for their contribution, it's really equally important that I thank Dr. Palita Abikun for his uh, excellent moderation. Uh, so thank you very much, sir, uh, for wonderful, uh, the wonderful coordination of the speakers and for conducting it in a sort of an excellent manner so that it became so useful for all, uh, all who uh, sat here with us, joined with us for these two hours. Uh, so thank you very much. On behalf of SLMS, let me communicate my gratitude to all speakers and all who got involved with organizing this excellent program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Padma. Shall I say one thing? Can uh, can you try, all of you, can you try to open your videos? We you want to take a photograph. Yes. Can you all open your videos if you don't mind? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank so you. thank you very much. Uh, um, let me also add a word of thanks to particularly our elite panel, three of them, uh, and to Dr. Alaka Singh for joining us, and all of you for your very, very active participation and interest. I hope we at least tried to try our best to satisfy some of the, the, the questions and and the, and the ideas that you that you had you want to clarify.
I hope that was good enough. But uh, this is not the end. We will go on learning. We'll maybe in another six months or so, if we have a sem seminar like this, a webinar like this, there'll be new questions coming up. And uh, that is the nature of this thing. So thank you once again. And uh, have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, thank you sir. And uh, thank you for inviting us to be part of this wonderful uh, discussion. Thanks a lot.